Book 2, Chapter 18 of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Doug Delisle. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 2, Chapter 18. The Calamities and Slaughters that Came Upon the Jews. 1. Now the people of Caesarea had slain the Jews that were among them, on the very same day and hour when the soldiers were slain, which one would think must have come to pass by the direction of Providence, insomuch that in one hour's time above twenty thousand Jews were killed, and all Caesarea was emptied of its Jewish inhabitants. For Florus caught such as ran away, and sent them in bonds to the galleys. Upon which stroke that the Jews received at Caesarea, the whole nation was greatly enraged. So they divided themselves into several parties, and laid waste to the villages of the Syrians and their neighboring cities, Philadelphia and Sebenitis, and Gerasa and Pella, and Scythopolis, and after them Gadara and Hippos. And falling upon Golanitis, some cities they destroyed there, and some they set on fire, and then went to Gadassa, belonging to the Tyrians, and to Ptolemaeus, and to Gaba, and to Caesarea. Nor was either Sebaste or Ascalon able to oppose the violence with which they were attacked. And when they had burnt these to the ground, they entirely demolished Anthedon and Gaza. Many also of the villages that were about every one of those cities were plundered, and an immense slaughter was made of the men who were caught in them. 2. However, the Syrians were even with the Jews in the multitude of the men whom they slew, for they killed those whom they caught in their cities, and that not only out of the hatred they bear them, as formerly, but to prevent the danger under which they were from them, so that the disorders in all Syria were terrible, and every city was divided into two armies, encamped one against the other, and the preservation of the one party was in the destruction of the other. So the daytime was spent in shedding of blood, and the night in fear, which was of the two the more terrible. For when the Syrians thought they had ruined the Jews, they had the Judaizers in suspicion also. And as each side did not care to slay those whom they only suspected on the other, so did they greatly fear them when they were mingled with the other, as if they were certainly foreigners. Moreover, greediness of gain was a provocation to kill the opposite party, even to such as had of old appeared very mild and gentle towards them, for they without fear plundered the effects of the slain, and carried off the spoils of those whom they slew to their own houses, as if they had been gained in a set battle. And he was esteemed a man of honor, who got the greatest share, as having prevailed over the greatest number of his enemies. It was then common to see cities filled with dead bodies, still laying unburied, and those of old men mixed with infants, all dead and scattered about together. Women also lay amongst them without any covering for their nakedness. You might then see the whole province full of inexpressible calamities, while the dread of still more barbarous practices, which were threatened, was everywhere greater than what had already been perpetrated. 3. And thus far the conflict had been between Jews and foreigners, but when they made excursions to Scythopolis, they found Jews that acted as enemies. For as they stood in battle array with those of Scythopolis, and preferred their own safety before their relation to us, they fought against their own countrymen. Nay, their alacrity was so very great that those of Scythopolis suspected them. These were afraid, therefore, lest they should make an assault upon the city in the night time, and, to their great misfortune, should thereby make an apology for themselves to their own people for the revolt from them. So they commanded them that in case they would confirm their agreement and demonstrate their fidelity to them, who were of a different nation, they should go out of the city with their families to a neighboring grove. And when they had done as they were commanded without suspecting anything, the people of Scythopolis lay still for the interval of two days to tempt them to be secure. But on the third night they watched their opportunity and cut all their throats, some as they lay unguarded and some as they lay asleep. The number that was slain was above thirteen thousand, and then they plundered them of all they had. 4. It will deserve our relation what befell Simon. He was the son of one Saul, a man of reputation among the Jews. 
This man was distinguished from the rest by the strength of his body and the boldness of his conduct, although he abused them both to the mischiefing of his countrymen. For he came every day and slew a great many of the Jews of Scythopolis, and he frequently put them to flight, and became himself alone the cause of his army's conquering. But a just punishment overtook him for the murders he had committed upon those of the same nation with him. For when the people of Scythopolis threw their darts at them in the grove, he drew his sword, but he did not attack any of the enemy, for he saw that he could do nothing against such a multitude. But he cried out after a very moving manner and said, O you people of Scythopolis, I deservedly suffer for what I have done with relation to you. When I gave you such security of my fidelity to you, by slaying so many of those that were related to me. Wherefore we very justly experienced the perfidiousness of foreigners, while we acted after a most wicked manner against our own nation. I will therefore die, polluted wretch as I am, by mine own hands, for it is not fit I should die by the hand of our enemies. And let the same action be to me both a punishment for my great crimes, and a testimony of my courage to my commendation that so no one of our enemies may have it to brag of, that he it was that slew me, and no one may insult upon me as I fall. Now when he had said this, he looked round about him upon his family with eyes of commiseration and of rage. That family consisted of a wife and children and his aged parents. So in the first place he caught his father by his gray hairs, and ran his sword through him, and after him he did the same to his mother, who willingly received it and after them he did the like to his wife and children, every one almost offering themselves to his sword, as desirous to prevent being slain by their enemies. So when he had gone over all his family, he stood upon their bodies to be seen by all, and stretching out his right hand, that his action might be observed by all, he sheathed his entire sword into his own bowels. This young man was to be pitied, on account of the strength of his body and the courage of his soul, but since he had assured foreigners of his fidelity against his own countrymen, he suffered deservedly. 5. Besides this murder at Scythopolis, the other cities rose up against the Jews that were among them. Those of Ascalon slew 2,500, and those of Ptolemaeus 2,000, and put not a few into bonds. Those of Tyre also put a great number to death, but kept a greater number in prison. Moreover, those of Hippos and those of Gadara did the like while they put to death the boldest of the Jews, but kept those of whom they were afraid in custody, as did the rest of the cities of Syria, according as they every one either hated them or were afraid of them. Only the Antiochans and the Sidontans and the Pamians spared those that dwelt with them, and would not endure either to kill any of the Jews or to put them in bonds. And because they spared them, because their own number was so great that they despised their attempts. But I think the greatest part of this favor was owing to their commiseration of those whom they saw to make no innovations. As for the Gerasans, they did no harm to those that abode with them, and for those who had a mind to go away, they conducted them as far as their borders reached. 6. There was also a plot laid against the Jews in Agrippa's kingdom, for he was himself gone to Cestius Gallus, to Antioch, but had left one of his companions, whose name was Noaris, to take care of the public affairs, which Noaris was of kin to King Sohemus. Footnote. Of the Sohemus we have mentioned made by Tacitus, we also learn from Dio that his father was king of the Arabians of Iteria, which Iteria is mentioned by St. Luke chapter 3 verse 1, both whose testimonies are quoted here by Dr. Hudson. End of footnote. Now there came certain men, seventy in number, out of Batania, who were the most considerable for their families and prudence for the rest of the people. These desired to have an army put into their hands, that if any tumult should happen, they might have about them a guard sufficient to restrain such as might rise up against them. This Noaris sent out some of the king's armed men by night, and slew all those seventy men which bold action he ventured upon without the consent of Agrippa, and was such a lover of money that he chose to be so wicked to his own countrymen, though he brought ruin on the kingdom thereby. And thus cruelly did he treat the nation, 
and this contrary to the laws also, until Agrippa was informed of it, who did not indeed dare to put him to death out of regard to Sohemus, but still he put an end to his procuratorship immediately. But as to the seditious, they took the citadel which was called Cyprus, which was above Jericho, and cut the throats of the garrison, and utterly demolished the poor fortifications. This was about the same time that the multitude of the Jews that were at Machoris persuaded the Romans who were in garrison to leave the place and deliver it up to them. These Romans, being in great fear, lest the place should be taken by force, made an agreement with them to depart upon certain conditions. And when they had obtained the security they desired, they delivered up the citadel, into which the people of Machoris put a garrison for their own security and held it in their own power. 7. But for Alexandria, the sedition of the people of the place against the Jews was perpetual, and this from that very time when Alexander the Great, upon finding the readiness of the Jews in assisting him against the Egyptians, and as a reward for such their assistance, gave them equal privileges in the city with the Grecians themselves, which honorary reward continued among them under his successors, who also set apart for them a particular place, that they might live without being polluted by the Gentiles, and were therefore not so much intermixed with foreigners as before. They also gave them this further privilege, that they should be called Macedonians. Nay, when the Romans got possession of Egypt, neither the first Caesar, nor any one that came after him, thought of diminishing the honors which Alexander had bestowed on the Jews. But still conflicts perpetually arose with the Grecians, and although the governors did every day punish many of them, yet did the sedition grow worse. But at this time especially, when there were tumults and other places also, the disorders among them were put into a greater flame, for when the Alexandrians had once a public assembly to deliberate about an embassage they were sending to Nero, a great number of Jews came flocking to the theater. But when their adversaries saw them, they immediately cried out, and called them their enemies, and said they came as spies upon them, upon which they rushed out and laid violent hands upon them. And as for the rest, they were slain as they ran away, but there were three men whom they caught, and hauled them along, in order to have them burnt alive. But all the Jews came in a body to defend them, who at first threw stones at the Grecians, but after that they took lamps, and rushed with violence into the theater and threatened that they would burn the people to a man. And this they had soon done, unless Tiberius Alexander, the governor of the city, had restrained their passions. However, this man did not begin to teach them wisdom by arms, but sent among them privately some of the principal men, and thereby entreated them to be quiet, and not provoke the Roman army against them. But the seditious made a jest of the entreaties of Tiberius, and reproached him for so doing. 8. Now when he perceived that those who were for innovations would not be pacified till some great calamity should overtake them, he sent out upon them those two Roman legions that were in the city, and together with them five thousand other soldiers, who by chance were come together out of Libya to the ruin of the Jews. They were also permitted not only to kill them, but to plunder them of what they had, and to set fire to their houses. These soldiers rushed violently into that part of the city that was called Delta, where the Jewish people lived together, and did as they were bidden, though not without bloodshed on their own side also. For the Jews got together, and set those that were the best armed among them in the forefront, and made a resistance for a great while. But when once they gave back, they were destroyed unmercifully, and this their destruction was complete, some being caught in the open field, and others forced into their houses which houses were first plundered of what was in them, and then set on fire by the Romans, wherein no mercy was shown to the infants, and no regard had to the aged. But they went on into the slaughter of persons of every age, till all the place was overflowed with blood, and fifty thousand of them lay dead upon heaps. Nor had the remainder been preserved, had they not betaken themselves to supplication. So Alexander commiserated their condition, and gave orders to the Romans to retire. Accordingly, these being accustomed to obey orders, left off killing at the first intimation. 
but the populace of Alexandria bears so very great hatred to the Jews that it was difficult to recall them, and it was a hard thing to make them leave their dead bodies. 9. And this was the miserable calamity which at this time befell the Jews at Alexandria. Hereupon Cestius thought fit no longer to lie still, while the Jews were everywhere up in arms. So he took out of Antioch the twelve legion entire, and out of each of the rest he selected two thousand, with six cohorts of footmen, and four troops of horsemen, besides those auxiliaries which were sent by the kings. Of these Antiochus sent two thousand horsemen, and three thousand footmen, with as many archers. And Agrippa sent the same number of footmen, and one thousand horsemen. So Hemus also followed with four thousand, a third part whereof were horsemen, but most part were archers. And thus did he march to Ptolemais. There was also great numbers of auxiliaries gathered together from the free cities, who indeed had not the same skill in martial affairs, but made up in their alacrity and in their hatred to the Jews what they wanted in skill. There came also along with Cestius Agrippa himself, both as a guide in his march over the country, and a director, what was fit to be done. So Cestius took part of his forces, and marched hastily to Zabulon, a strong city of Galilee, which was called the City of Men, and divides the country of Ptolemaeus from our nation. This he found deserted by its men, the multitude having fled to the mountains, but full of all sorts of good things. Those he gave leave to the soldiers to plunder, and set fire to the city, although it was of admirable beauty, and had its houses built like those in Tyre, and Sidon, and Beritus. After this he overran all the country, and seized upon whatsoever came in his way, and set fire to the villages that were round about them, and then returned to Ptolemaeus. But when the Syrians, and especially those of Beritus, were busy in plundering, the Jews pulled up their courage again, for they knew that Cestius was retired, and fell upon those that were left behind unexpectedly, and destroyed about two thousand of them. Footnote. Spanheim notes on the place that this later Antiochus, who was called Epiphawas, is mentioned by Dio, and that he is mentioned by Josephus elsewhere twice also. End footnote. 10. And now Cestius himself marched from Ptolemaeus, and came to Caesarea, but he sent part of his army before him to Joppa, and gave order, that if they could take that city by surprise, they should keep it, but that in case the citizens should perceive they were coming to attack them, that they should stay for him, and for the rest of the army, but that in case the citizens should perceive they were coming to attack them, that they then should stay for him, and for the rest of the army. So some of them made a brisk march by the seaside, and some by land, and so coming upon them on both sides, they took the city with ease. And as the inhabitants had made no provisions beforehand for a fight, nor had gotten anything ready for fighting, the soldiers fell upon them and slew them all with their families, and then plundered and burnt the city. The number of the slain was 8,400. In like manner, Cestius sent also a considerable body of horsemen to the Toparchy of Narbertine, that adjoined to Caesarea, who destroyed the country, and slew a great multitude of its people. They also plundered what they had and burnt their villages. But Cestius sent Gallus, the commander of the Twelfth Legion, into Galilee, and delivered to him as many of his forces as he supposed sufficient to subdue that nation. He was received by the strongest city of Galilee, which was Sephorus, with acclamations of joy. Which wise conduct of that city occasioned the rest of the cities to be in quiet, while the seditious part and the robbers ran away to that mountain, which lies in the very middle of Galilee, and is situated over against Sephorus. It is called Azamon. So Gallus brought his forces against them. But while those men were in the superior parts above the Romans, they easily threw their darts upon the Romans, as they made their approaches, and slew about two hundred of them. But when the Romans had gone round the mountains, and were gotten into the parts above their enemies, the others were soon beaten. Nor could they, who had only light armor on, sustain the force of them that fought them armed all over. Nor when they were beaten, could they escape the enemy's horsemen. 
insomuch that only some few concealed themselves in certain places hard to come at among the mountains, while the rest, above two thousand in number, were slain. End of Book 2, Chapter 18 Recording by Doug Delisle